some people like to stand here and make the I'm the king of the world reference from Titanic. And I suppose I could do it as an opening joke, but I don't think I will. There's more to humor than pop culture references. In fact, intelligent comedy. Wait, hold on. Hail to the king, baby. So if you like fists and you like them full of frags, I have just the game for you. I decided to start off the year with a game that everyone can enjoy. And yes, I'm aware it's most likely March. Pistol of Frags is a fun, unique, western-themed shooter that is perfectly free of charge, and provided you have a computer at home, you should be able to play it, because not only is it playable in a toaster, it is playable on an overpriced toaster. <laughs> Originally a source mod and released as its own game in 2014, Pistol of Frags has been one of my all-time favorites since, be it as a competitive risk versus reward shooter or just as something to do while listening to an audiobook or a podcast. It is rare that a game can balance a skill-based risk versus reward system with a casual frame this well, and it is even rare when that game is set in the Wild West, doubly so when it actually pulls it off. Fistful of Frags is, beyond a doubt, a modern gem. It is great fun, and it is not very well known, even as a source mod. And speaking of source mods, that is exactly what it looks like, because it is. Now with that in mind, Half-Life 2 style graphics have actually aged fairly well. Models are decent, textures are sharp where it matters, and you can always tell what is happening on screen. So, I think it's fair to say that the visuals are serviceable. Moreover, the Source engine has some effects that still hold up surprisingly well, most notable of which are the physics. For one, this is a game that features the long-lost art of old-school ragdolls. The physics account for a lot of elements that make Fistful Frag stand out even among modern titles. You get a system of throwables, dynamic objects, and satisfying kicks. And even throwable dynamic object kicks. Yes, you can kill people that way. There are even somewhat destructible props, which make for rather impressive explosions. While you won't see the explosion all that well, you will see the effects of the force driving it, usually exaggerated in a good way. The game also features some minute modernized details, such as the occasional particle effect and the ability to see your lower body. Also, this quirky blood effect, which is either a weirdly positioned abdominal wound or the reason I gave up martial arts, and I rather like the way characters' clothes get torn as they take damage. It may be a small detail, but I think it counts. So while it definitely looks old, the visuals of Fistful of Frags are by no means dated. In fact, the visual quality is more reminiscent of a modern retro throwback with some improvements, or alternatively, a decent remaster, more so than an aged title. Two things I believe have been especially well done in regards to the design are the weapons and the maps. Concerning the weapons, not only is there variety in their appearances, wherein each gun looks unique, but there is also a congruity between the design of the weapon and its behavior in game. For instance, the Colt Navy looks like a working man's pistol, and that is exactly what it is. It is not too powerful, but it is cheap and reliable. On the other hand, you have the Schofield, which looks like the weapon of choice for the privileged man, and again, that is how it behaves in-game. It is more powerful than a Colt Navy, and it is easier to use. And here I should note that this is not a case of the all-too-common simplification that the better the weapon, the shinier the design. To illustrate, the BFG of Fistful of Frags is the Colt Walker, and it looks about as rugged and as battered as you can expect to find on the side of Midwall. By the way, if you got that reference with friends. I think the design favors caliber and implied veterancy to suggest the power of a given weapon, and that seems to be consistent throughout the game. Except for these two. Scaled down to laughable size and nicknamed the Harmless, they almost sound like what an ex-girlfriend would talk about behind your back. Until you try using them. These two are the Wild Wild West version of the noisy cricket for Man in Black. They may be weak individually, but the DPS more than makes up for it. This is what undercompensating looks like. It is pure alpha male gunslinging. Multi-kill. Killing spree. Hey, it's 4 p.m. Guns look western, and they behave western. I mean that, of course, in the sense of the popularized Wild West mythos established through decades of cinematic tradition. And the same tendency applies to the maps as well. Visually speaking, the maps uphold the game's western theme to a near perfect degree. You will see the expected bars, saloons, and banks, often in the same map, as well as deserts, mining operations, railroads with rideable trains, and even forts and frontier snow places. The chances are, if you can think of a western setting, this Frags has a map built around it. I've said it before, one thing that is immune to the effects of aging is detail, and Fistful Frags has that covered. From the physics and the maps and the weapons design I've mentioned already, to minor things like hats flying off and headshots, and horses that kick back if you harass them. Not to mention, the playable factions also represent the major iconic figures of the Wild West. The lawmen, the outlaws, the gangs, Owen Wilson. Wow. Okay, truth be told, I would have rather been able to play as somebody cooler and more relevant. I'd rather be an Apache warrior than a generic blonde guy. But at least he has a charming laugh. <laughs> oh. 
Also, I prefer the appearance of the Henry rifle to the Yellow Boy, which is its replacement. You can mod that easily, though. Among other things. We'll get there. It is hard to find anything resembling a major flaw in the game's presentation. For the most part, it does a good job. It conveys the setting well, and it has a lot of charm, even down to the voice acting. Pass the whiskey. Hey, gamers! We'll get there. The artistic direction of the game does not take itself very seriously, but it captures the setting very well. It is competent, and it is charming. And there is also the added benefit of its extremely low system requirements. Between 2014 and 2017, I've played this game on a Core 2 Duo with four different GPUs, and I got a solid 60 FPS at 1080 resolution and high settings. I believe the boat map was a bit laggy, but that was an issue for a lot of people. Either way, if you have anything even remotely resembling modern hardware, and by that I mean a system that can reliably run a maxed out Half-Life 2, you should be able to run this. On the performance side of things, there is, of course, the game's stability, and I have not experienced any serious issues, which is more than I can say for most modern titles. On the other hand, though, the game can often appear clunky. It's nothing that a person who's been around would find exceptionally jarring, but it might bother some of you. There can be the occasional glitch, and servers are hard to find if you want to play late at night. Perhaps the most noticeable issue is the occasional discrepancy between what is happening in the game and what you get to see client-side. You will sometimes find yourself firing at the same time as your opponent, and sometimes even earlier, only to see your shot fail to register. This also goes for melee attacks that connect even though your attacker was out of range. Now, in reality, these are not crazy hitboxes or the game being unfair. It is rather what happens as opposed to what you get to see. When you experience this, know that your opponent most likely did shoot slightly before you did. By the time you got to fire, you were already dead. It's just that the game didn't tell you in time. And yes, it can be annoying. In fact, it is annoying. So much so that I have included it in my review. But I think events like these are mostly the exception that proves the rule. Fistful Frags is for the most part stable. I've had a lot more issues with modern AAA titles than I've had with this one. It just so happens that its age and its lack of modern polish might make the occasional hiccup appear more jarring than it really is. And I don't mean that as a mere excuse, because Fistful of Frags stands and falls with its mechanics. It tries to do so many things that, if it is to be successful in its ambition, the medium between the player and the game, that is, the mechanics, cannot be anything but tight. Between firearms, a melee system, and throwables, including throwable firearms, as well as all of the combos stemming from the different weapons in the environment, Fistful of Frags relies heavily on the stability of its structure. So when I say that it is a predominantly stable game, I do mean it, not just in reference to the low standard of AAA titles, but also on its own. And now that I've covered the technical side, I think this is the ideal segue into the gameplay, by beginning with that part of game design that stands between the two, the bridge between the technical part of the developer building the game and the active part of the player playing it. This refers, of course, to the game's mechanics, and with good reason too. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that Fistful of Frags is a fun and unique western shooter, and all three of these things are fully connected to the way that it plays. When I say western, I don't mean just another shooter but with a western skin. What I mean is that the gameplay itself is actually built around a western frame, and that playing it reinforces the feel of the setting. When I say unique, I don't mean it in the sense that its only competitor is Call of Juarez. I mean it in a sense that it stands alone in the mechanics that it pulls off. And when I say fun, we'll figure that out as we go. One of the first things people notice when playing this is that the weapon selection is an actual western era arsenal. Pistol Frags is loyal to its setting. Guns fire one bullet at a time and, on average, about six bullets before needing to reload, often manually. Check out the sniper rifle. It's a one-shot kill, but fire at the wrong time and it will cost you. So you need to make sure that every bullet counts. Yes, it is important that you shoot first, but it matters a lot more that you land the shot. And even with a kill secured, you're usually left with only two-thirds of your cylinder full. Tactical reloads play a much bigger role than they do in other games. Do you risk the time it takes to reload entirely or do you load only a few bullets to get you through your next encounter? This adds a level of suspense you don't usually see in shooters. But it doesn't end there, as being caught with your gun empty is not necessarily a death sentence. You can always pull out another weapon if you have it in your inventory, be it another firearm or a knife. And if all else fails, you can throw your gun as a stone or resort to your fists. And yes, all four options are viable. One moment you're in an honorable gunslinging duel, the next moment you're in a gritty brawl. Consider the mechanics with which you need to familiarize yourself if you're to do well reliably. Apart from reflexes and aim, you need the game sense to conserve your bullets, the ability to lead targets into throwables, and the correct timing for melee attacks. 
Knife throwing is more or less an essential skill. It is strangely intuitive and it is very satisfying when you pull it off. And melee is not just the last resort. Considering that the brass knuckles have the chance to disarm enemies and kicks can very nearly stun their target, melee becomes an integral part of the gameplay loop. One very common tactic is to shoot an enemy and then immediately kick them to line them up for a second round. And every now and then you can get owned by a person disarming you and shooting you with your own pistol. Here, let me redeem myself. As you can see, we have started with 6 shooters and slow reloads and we have come to 2 additional combat systems in response to it. The game takes a simple mechanic related to the setting and then it develops a unique system around it. This is a game that rewards creativity and skill, and just as importantly, all of these mechanics fit the western setting. And here I would like to say a word or two about that first entry level skill, that is, aiming, because it is more than simply clicking on people, and there is a very interesting harmony between it and the setting. The aiming system in Fistful Frag is built around a balance between accuracy and movement. As you can see, when you're running, your chances of landing a shot are about as high as your chances of finding a job with a degree in the humanities. Conversely, when you stand still, your chances of hitting your target are about as high as your chances of employment when you're dreaming. And there are the intermediaries of walking and fanning, which are different ratio trade-offs between speed and accuracy. And so far, there is nothing strange about that. Plenty of games have this mechanic. But there are two things to note here. One is that Fistful of Frags goes a bit farther, especially with the pistols. When you select a spawning weapon, you also get to select your dominant hand. And these have different perks, wherein left-handed favors accuracy in your left hand and right-handed favors speed in your right. Ambidextrous is balanced and fanning is self-explanatory. What you can achieve with the ability to walk and shoot reliably, you cannot achieve with extra accuracy when standing still, and vice versa. It adds variety to the gameplay and it suits different playstyles. I mentioned fanning, and that is a quick fix to the problem with the slow rate of fire. It throws your accuracy way off, but it has its uses in close quarters. So again, you have a mechanic befitting the theme, which complements another mechanic that also stems from the setting. And another thing that stands out for me is how well the nearing of the reticle coincides with the western subject. Whenever you strafe or stop to shoot and wait for the crosshair to focus, you might notice that the effect almost simulates the drawing of a gun. The western opus, be it cinematic, literary, or even musical, relies on this element to build suspense. You won't usually see Clint Eastwood running and gunning like an action hero. A western protagonist mainly stops to shoot and relies on outdrawing his opponent. And that is kind of what this otherwise generic mechanic achieves in Festival of Frags. Whereas many other games do it as well, it finds a special sense of congruity here. Special forces don't forget how to hold a gun the moment they move a fraction of a millimeter. Cowboys, on the other hand, need to clear leather before they can fire. What is remarkable about this is that it is not a minigame or an animation, but a very spontaneous real-time effect. I don't know if it was deliberate, but it definitely clicks with the setting. I would even go so far as to say that this kind of gunplay with sidestepping, drawing, and making your shots count is the ideal combat system for a western shooter. It's subtle, and it fits very well. But suppose you're tired of pistols and sidestepping and its unique congruity with the setting. You would rather run and gun. Then what? Well, you just pick up a shotgun. If you go for tier 1 or 2, you will need to complement them with something else as well, seeing as they're double-barreled. But if you can get your hands on a Golden Crate pump action, the game for you becomes Quake. And yes, it is just as fun and just as viable as other approaches. There is something for everybody in Festival of Frags, provided you're willing to learn to play and provided you don't take things too seriously. There is an inherent silliness in Festival of Frags. This is a game where you can shoot the lit dynamite out of a person's hand and have it count as a double kill and a self reckoning It is also a game where you can equip brass knuckles, boots, and batarangs, I mean throwing knives, and roleplay as Cowboy Batman. You can never go wrong harassing snipers. And this might be a good time to mention that a grappling hook could take this game to another level. Batman Arkham series are great, but do they have a punch sound effect that is perfectly congruent with the Adam West theme? I don't think so. And I wasn't kidding about the melee system by the way, it is viable. Note that I am first place in this Parado Batman. And that says a lot about our society. Conversely, if you're more into finicky hard to learn mechanics, you could try mastering the bow. 
The curve is a bit too strict in my opinion, but learning to be good with it can be very fun, especially as you begin to land headshots, not to mention the high kill reward. The weapons are for the most part decently balanced, so in theory you should be able to do well with most of them, even if some may feel off at first. Okay, so, let's talk balance. When you start playing, you will most likely go for handguns, seeing as they're the most reliable. Their default is the Colt Navy. It has moderate range and rate of fire, and it takes 2-3 shots to get a target from full health to zero. It is a decent primary, and if you can pick up something better along the way, it makes for an excellent secondary. You might have noticed they've been using it a lot in these clips. A more powerful, albeit slower firing version is the Remington Army. It is statistically better, but it is a bit slow for my taste. I must note, though, it can be easier to fan for the same reason. And a Volcanic is the exact opposite, in that it trades damage and range for rate of fire. And at first, it may seem like a viable option only if you're too dehydrated to try spitting at your opponent. But despite being a nerf gun, it is still capable of top fragging. I wouldn't recommend using it, but it can be good in a death by a thousand cuts kind of way, provided somebody has inflicted 999 cuts first. As I said, you can do well with just about any weapon. Moving past starting items, the Schofield I've already mentioned is a straight upgrade to both the Navy and the Remington in every guard. It might actually be the most well-rounded of the revolvers. And the Peacemaker, while slower, has the highest damage output and it is the only pistol with one-tap potential. In this sense, it is the best one so far, but I think it ties with the Schofield in performance. And finally, there is the Colt Walker. This is a big gun for big boys with a big need to compensate. If you can get your hands on it, do it. It is the kind of gun used by people named Roland and Cuthbert and Eddie. This is the click-to-kill gun of Pistol Frags. Yet consider the ways it's been kept from being overpowered. For one, its rate of fire is comparable to Counter-Strike SOP. So if you miss your shot, your chances of survival go way down. And just look at its reload, whereas you can cancel at any time, loading even a single bullet takes a while. So while it may be click to kill, it doesn't come without its downsides, because just like writing rap lyrics, it is also a press R to risk getting in serious trouble kind of weapon. You essentially get 6 kills at most before having to either part with it or risk reloading. The modest Colt Navy on the other hand can load about 3 bullets before any of its higher tier counterparts, not to mention its economy and accessibility. As you can see, whereas some weapons can definitely replace others, it is not the case that they are necessarily preferable in every circumstance, and much like an early cheap unit in an RTS, there is merit in sticking with the default. I've already covered the shotguns in a quote-unquote specialist weapons, like the bow and the sniper rifle, and I guess I could also mention the dynamite, but I'm yet to learn how to be even remotely, relatively, kind of, somewhat decent in a relative sort of way with it. It has the potential to do cool things, it is just that I cannot demonstrate any. But I'd like to say a word or two about the rifles. The rifles are this game's response to a quick scoping solution. These are the Spencer rifle and the Smith carbine. And as you might have guessed, they're accurate but slow. You can choose to spawn with the Smith, and it accounts for some serious trade offs. It has only one bullet before needing to reload, which makes it crucial that you either land a headshot or that you have a reliable backup option. It's a decent rifle, but it has a weird damage drop off at range, which kind of turns it into a weapon designed to annoy people. See? 96 damage. I'm annoyed because I did not get the kill. He is annoyed because he was left with only 4 HP, and his killer is annoyed because they did not get full points for it. But if you give it some practice, instead of using it as a poor man's sniper rifle, you just might find that it is perfectly viable. It allows for one taps at ranges that other weapons cannot, and provided you can consistently land headshots, the Smith Carbine is a guaranteed win in one on one duels provided you're fighting only one enemy at a time, that is. And that is why a rate of fire matters. And lastly, we have the mare's leg. This is a unique weapon that lies somewhere between a rifle and a pistol. And frankly, I didn't like it at first. It felt like an inaccurate slow two-shot weapon. I only picked it up to record content and possibly complain. But I gave it a fair chance, and in the same session, I realized just how good it is. It feels sloppier than your average revolver, but it works just as well, and even better once you get accustomed to its mechanics. It is less accurate than a Colt Navy, but landing a headshot is a guaranteed one-shot kill. You can't do that with a Navy. Its rate of fire may be slow, but that makes fanning much easier. In fact, if I were to describe it in one phrase, it would be a close-range headshot and fanning weapon. It is not the case that it does not work over range, it's just that it will take you longer to zero in and it won't deal full damage. Either way, it's not the kind of weapon you want to walk into through an arrow passage. It exemplifies the gameplay loop very well. It is all about understanding the weapon's strengths and weaknesses and playing around them, all the while acting with your own strengths and weaknesses in mind. You take risks. If you're good enough, they pay off. And if they don't pay off, you blame the game. Let me reiterate, the arsenal of Fistful Frag suits plenty of playstyles and player preferences, all the while remaining loyal to the western theme. 
The rule of thumb is that pistols are the most versatile, but other weapons can overpower them depending on the context. Now with that said, I don't agree with all of the balancing changes in this game. I think there are some weapons that have bad stats, and using them is, for the most part, suboptimal. For one, I think that the yellow boy is the worst thing since unsliced bread. It used to be great, but now it deals low damage, and instead of compensating this with a high rate of fire, the repeating animation takes a while, and instead of at least giving the player the benefit of mobility, it actually forces them to aim down the sights. Using this gun is like having skinny arms and a beer belly at the beach, or like having an abnormally big shoe size in a small Time for your wallet. Or the coach gun. This is a tier 2 double barrel shotgun. It used to be devastating up close, and I can kind of see why it has been nerfed, but as it is now it can barely compete with the Colt Navy, which is a starting pistol. I agree that it is no longer OP, but if your boomstick does not pack much of a boom, you're not shopping as smart. These points have been brought up in one of the game's reviews on Steam as well. It also happens to be the first review that shows up, and it is negative in stark contrast to most other reviews. So I figured I should probably address this controversy. The reviewer mentions that a lot of the weapons have been excessively nerfed, and I do agree with them there. They also mention the inability to pick up dropped weapons, and yes, this can also be a problem. Here's an example. As you can see in this clip, both my opponent and I make use of the melee mechanic, which leaves both of us unarmed. The bandito picks up both pistols, but it is to no avail. That's fair enough, but do you see a problem now? I can't get my gun back, nor can I take that of my fallen opponent. And whereas this particular event may be incidental, it causes other more noticeable issues down the line. For one, it reduces the presence of red crate and gold crate items late game, since they are not dropped but simply disappear. It discourages the more aggressive playstyle of using the guns of fallen players instead of reloading, and it doesn't allow players to make as much use of the game's varied arsenal. On the other hand though, some other complaints by this user, like dark areas having been made brighter, seem subjective in nature, and the developers pointed that out. Other still are issues that have been addressed since, as the monetary system has been removed from deathmatch. Considering the game still receives updates, I don't think there is much point in talking about temporary changes, so I won't take sides. I will just say that the reviewer does make some good points, but I don't think the game deserves a negative review because of them. And speaking of updates, yesterday I played a little to get some extra footage, and I came across this. She weighs 150 kilograms and fires $200 custom tooled cartridges of 10,000 rounds per minute. It costs $400,000 to fire this weapon for 12 seconds. And they did it on the budget of a free indie game. While it is true that the deathmatch format is not as fast and as chaotic as it used to be, concluding that this makes Fistful Frags a shadow of its former self would be misleading, because deathmatch is still a great experience, and even more so, it would not be fair to how much this game has grown since its initial conception. What started out as a deathmatch game now has single player co-op and team play as well. The single player is not a story driven campaign but a series of challenges the player gets to perform. And I do mean challenges, these missions will test your skills. The one we are watching at present is a zombie survival type where the seemingly low number you need to kill is deceptively hard. You will find that out as soon as you start reloading and get swarmed by half a dozen moonshine induced apple consumers. This user gets it. From what I gather, the major skill needed here is landing consistent headshots. And good luck with that. This other challenge has you kicking enemies, and this one is about using the bow efficiently. While I would be interested in seeing some kind of an official single player, these are good enough on their own. They're not really my thing, but you might find them appealing if you like to test your skills or just kill time offline. The co-op is similar to the single-player missions, and you can play it with up to 8 people. I can't talk about it much, as my 8 gamer friends go to another school, but I can tell you that it is sufficiently entertaining if you and your buddy are looking for a convenient co-op experience. And team play is a major multiplayer mode in addition to deathmatch. Now there are a few things to say about this one, because it has potential, but I don't think it really lives up to it. The premise itself sounds good. The game's solid mechanics are centered around an objective-based team competition. The goal can be to capture the point or payload. You start each round with an amount of cash you can spend on weapons, similar to Counter-Strike, except that here you can carry a lot more and you get to respawn if you're killed. It makes your performance matter by rewarding you with currency which you spend on better items and it seems to have gone for the best of both worlds between COD and Counter-Strike in regards to the respawn system, wherein the cost of weapons makes each life matter but being killed is not necessarily game over for you. There is an additional cooperative element in the sense of makeshift medics as some teammates can carry whiskey jugs to heal their allies. And so far the game mode sounds decent. And it is, when it works. 
I like the map design too, especially that of payload maps, which makes use of narrow choke points that account for some particularly great either tactic or tactical advances, depending on your playstyle and your teammates. You can push through one bullet at a time, or you can rush, or you can use dynamite to break up the crowd. Warning your enemies can do that too. I like the interplay between playing the objective supporting your team from afar or flanking behind enemy cover, and the great thing about the freedom of loadouts in Fistful Frags is that all of these roles can be played fluidly and even interchangeably. Here I buy a Colt Walker and infiltrate their base to cut off enemy reinforcements. I take out their sniper and claim his weapon, then I fall back to the objective to cap the point and provide fire support from there. This is good multiplayer gameplay. It is dynamic, it is different from other games, and there is the sense of a team cooperating towards a common objective all the while opposing a sentient foe. Another thing I like is the dynamic between open and closed areas, which account for both long-range and short-range scenarios, wherein you'll need to be able to make use of rifles and pistols alike if you're to do well. Sometimes you'll need the accuracy of the Smith Carbine to take out that one guy causing trouble far ahead, or to make an instant one-shot so you can advance. At others, you'll need the quick-firing capabilities of a revolver. In others still, you will find yourself in so much trouble that you crave for no item other than the whiskey jug. Pass the whiskey. Relatable. So it can be good when it works, the problem is that a lot of the time it does not. One issue is repetitiveness, although entertaining at first, you will have seen all there is to see within a few sessions of playing. Most of these maps are small, three-lane maps with little variation in the layout. There is not much you can do in them either. They are not the meticulous, cleverly crafted 5v5 maps of competitive Counter-Strike, which though small have callouts and gimmicks and different tactics to try. These maps are closer to competitive wingmen, which come off as great entertainment until you realize there are only so many things you can do in them. If you don't want to camp or rush, your only choices are straight left or straight right, which might work if you play only once in five years, but I don't think that has been working out very well either. The capture the point maps are especially bad in this regard, as their isometric nature adds to the feeling of repetitiveness and also strips the design of the organic charm in terms of deathmatch. Another is team balancing, much like April 20th, but with a 50% chance that it is opposite day, you are either rolling or you are being rolled. This is a problem with many team-based games. Balanced teams in a challenging fight are few and far between. For the most part, it is one of two extremes. You win by a lot, or you lose by a lot. The sense of immersion in a team effort breaks when you find yourself and your teammates not actually working together, with several people looking at one spot while another is left unguarded as you get sniped from an infiltrator nobody cares to take out. And when you replace the instant respawn of deathmatch with a timer and a price in the inventory, minor issues that lead up to unnecessary deaths become much more noticeable. Take a look at deathmatch. I ran past that guy, but like still allowed him to shoot me. But seeing as I will respawn almost instantly, it doesn't really matter. But here, this player's lagging is interfering with everybody's aim, and this will have ramifications. So the flaws become more noticeable and less forgivable. The team play can be fun at times, but at present it feels somewhere between undercooked and ready to eat, but not as savory as you might have hoped. Now I do think there are ways to fix it. Bigger maps, larger player size, mounted guns, multiple objectives, secret passages, just to name a few. But as of recording this, the game does not seem to have an established culture around it, and these changes are yet to take effect. While I would recommend the team play game mode to people who play Fistful Frags, I don't think it is a reason to get into the game itself. There are many team-oriented games out there that are way better many of which are free, and some of which have closed. The mechanics make for a great foundation, the premise is promising, but it needs better execution. Flip over to Shootout, however, and you will come across an experience so well designed it would make the argument it deserves to be among the greats. Exceptional mechanics, solid map design, and unique gameplay. If the criteria for greatness is to offer high quality in a way that others cannot, and we are listing multiplayer deathmatch titles, Festival Frags belongs on that list. It is a well-designed system akin to an overly aggressive playground. Set in maps that are both organic in appearance and practical in effect, it allows for an ideal number of player encounters in different scenarios, keeping them as reasonable as necessary but with a healthy dose of unpredictable chaotic encounters. Here you get to experience the game's mechanics at their fullest, be it as a casual gunslinger, a serious achievement gamer, or the weird kid running around hitting people with an axe. But childhood memories aside, the shootout game mode is the strongest side of Fistful Frags. If you play the game, this is probably the main reason why. So the layout is simple. Shootouts can be either free for all or have up to four teams. You start off by selecting your team and your loadout, your selection of the latter being limited by the type of inventory you choose. You can change this every time you spawn by pressing B, by the way. Throughout the maps, you find crates from which you can get better items. These can be blue, red, or gold crates, rising in power in that order. Whenever you score a kill, you gain points thematically gold notoriety. How many you get depends on the weapon you use and the damage that you inflict. At the end of the match, the person with the most notoriety wins. Or do they? There's no explicit winner in this game mode in that you do not get any kind of message to make you feel good about it. Whereas the person who is first in the leaderboards is considered the victor, it is not necessarily the goal to which you strive. 
When playing, you can also go for any of the other accolades, such as your killstreak, frags per minute, or accuracy. Or if you cannot compete in anything else, you can always try to outdo your peers in drunkenness. But unlike high school reunions, this one is entirely devoid of any egoic concepts. You will not come to condemnation for the way that you play. Even though the skill ceiling is high and there are many things to learn, Fistle Frags is, in regards to the scoring system, a casual game. It does not try to impose on the player an obligation to perform. This is refreshing in comparison to most online shooters. When you're playing a serious game, something like, say, Rising Storm 2, and you're not doing well, you don't feel well either, because your entire team suffers for your performance or lack thereof. Moreover, if you're not doing well in a competitive shooter like CSGO, you feel downright bad. You must. Clutch. Because not only do you spend most of your time waiting to respawn, you're also actively losing rank. Fizzle Frag stands out in this regard. It is both primarily for fun. And you can tell that by its complete lack of anything even remotely related to online egoism. There are no level ups, no unlockables, no stats. Unless you count whatever this is. There really is no tacton progression system or any similarly artificial way to keep you going. Fizzle Frags offers one thing only. Fun. And you play for as long as you keep having it. Everything else is up to you. Whether you prefer deathmatch, team play, co-op, or single player challenges. Or gun game or modded deathmatch with crazy kicks. Hey, it's a source game. Go wild. But not too wild. Blow, chicka, blow, blow. And it is all part of the game's casual frame. You set your objective, if you even care for an objective, and you play. If you want to be first place, you try to get points. If you want to have the highest kill streak, you play a bit more carefully. And if you want to be best in all categories, you get good. This takes us all the way back to the beginning of the section. The appeal of Fistful Frags is not some false sense of accomplishment because you won an online match or because you progressed to a new rank. The appeal lies in its mechanics and the way you use them. I think the game's at its best with its spontaneous chaotic battles, these struggle-type events where a series of encounters lead to what feels like a sped-up version of survival of the fittest. There is a variety and a unique tension in these, and I think it is what accounts for the best part of any multiplayer experience. Such as when you are casually sniping and minding your own business, but you get ambushed from behind. You headshot the vigilante and you score a throwing knife kill in a bandito, because that's just how cool you are. But now you're in the middle of the battle without any weapons. So you try to run away to a safer place as they chase you, and you think you've been successful, only to realize you still have an angry knife-wielding desperado in your back. But then you remember you've had intensive training in the martial art known as French cabaret dances. And so you manage to get out and hide in the shadows so you can reload your gun for round 2. Unfortunately, there is no stealth mechanic. People can still see you in the shadows. For a three-way struggle in a rooftop where only one can survive, and that ultimate survivor is Darwin's favorite, yourself. So you kick your opponent's head off the roof in triumph and go downstairs to aid your teammate and survive long enough to get one more kill before somebody takes you out from the flanks. You will get to experience something like this just about every time you get a streak going, be it a minor adventure involving a headshot and a cinematic train kill, something more elaborate like the previous two examples, or a demonstration of skill like this 45 degree no scope nondescript body shot double kill. So there are a lot of things to experience in this game, from its unique mechanics and the mastery of several skill sets all the way to random encounters and downright. I lost my train of thought. And considering that the game still receives updates, we don't know what lies in its future. Of course, provided the player base is still active. And that is something I actually wanted to talk about. Whereas you do consider Fistful Frags to be the ideal western shooter, it is by no means the perfect shooter. I've mentioned some issues already, but those are not all that problematic in the great scheme of things. The balancing of multiplayer games shifts constantly, old issues are fixed and new ones appear, and the same goes for tweaks in performance and game modes, especially in big updates. What is a problem, however, is the fact that the player base is factually low. As of recording this, Fistful Frax has less active players than I have subscribers. That says a lot. And by that I mean very little. Even though the game is still very much alive, it is mostly a niche title, and only a handful of people actively play it. Surprisingly, this does not mean that you cannot find ongoing games. For the most part, you will be able to find a full server to join, especially if you use the server browser. But the lower player count is still palpable in the community. You will begin to notice the same few people appear in matches, and although that can be a sense of familiarity and homeliness, it also means that the player base does not receive new players, meaning it can only go down from there. Perhaps a bigger and more immediate side effect of the low player count is the lack of a developing community. With the exception of some smaller channels on a subreddit, there is not a lot of Fistful Frags content online, with one minor, major exception. Hey gamers! Guess what German985 uses for his games? Death Adder! Check out these shots, only on a Death Adder! This is obviously an inside joke, but it's hard to talk about Fistful Frags without mentioning Mr. Elbertson, as his early and continual coverage of the game might be responsible for as much as half of its player base. At least the cultured half. 
made it essential for a product like this to get coverage. Be it professional quote-unquote education, entertainment, or comedy, these products yet to live and grow by online content. And so far, Fistful of Frags has been rather stagnant in that regard. It simply lacks the kind of publicity that could introduce it to the common player. As a free game, not only does it not have the incentive to invest in advertising, but also most people treat it as a free product first, and they tend to leave it at that. It doesn't really seem to get the respect it deserves for what it does or what it has accomplished. In spite of its very positive ratings on Steam, I haven't seen content creators approach it from a critical perspective. So in that sense, it is an obscure game with a small player base, mechanics that may appear clunky at first, and no kind of progression system. This can make it seem empty or even unfinished, especially to the modern player. You don't usually walk up to somebody and tell them, hey, go out of your way to learn this quirky new thing that doesn't even pretend to get you anywhere and the cool kids don't even think it's cool because they don't even know it exists. But trust me, it's good. Now on its own and as far as the players themselves are concerned, this is not a problem as much as it is a caveat. But it does become a problem when the community begins to dwindle. And it has definitely dwindled. For a game that used to be a hit back in 2014, I believe Fistle of Frags deserves a lot more. And hence the video. A lot of passion has been put into Fistle of Frags, a project that has lasted for over half a decade as an official Steam game and even longer as a mod. And keep in mind it has been perfectly free of charge throughout this time. Though some of the mechanics have changed, a lot of these changes account for balance and extra features. And even though I do not have the kind of views to be able to contribute to the player count, I believe I can contribute to the game's print and gaming culture, more precisely to present the triumphs of initiative and good development, as these are qualities I highly value. With that said, if you happen to like what you've been seeing on screen, I do recommend giving the game a go. It doesn't take much to check it out, and if you find it fun, there is a lot you can do with it. Whether you're into testing your skills in an online match or just looking for a casual experience, Fistful Frags should be able to accommodate both. The downsides I've already mentioned. Not all game modes are equally as entertaining, there have been balancing changes since release, and the community is very small. But if you can look past that, you will find a unique game with a charming visual style, and a one-of-a-kind gameplay that offers both a high skill ceiling and casual fun alike. So it is definitely a good game, and it has arguably the best mechanics for a western shooter I've seen so far. In other words, and to summarize the video in short, Cowboy Game Cowboy Go Pew Pew, Mega Sex Game Only Big Dong Game I Play, and Yi. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and hope I'll be seeing you soon. Make sure to check out the game if it looks like something you might like. I'm sure you would, because I assure you, if your tastes are anything like mine, or if you're anything like me, you have my sympathies. And if you happen to be into modding, my friend from across the seas has made a mod that converts source engine maps into Call of Duty maps, and it requires only elementary knowledge of modding to accomplish. So if you're a modder or you think this sounds fun, definitely check it out. Links are in the description. And now a quick word to my subscribers. If you've been paying attention, you can probably tell that I've been working on this video on and off since February. And throughout that time, one thing that has helped me to keep at it has been the knowledge that there are people who genuinely enjoy my content. So the first thing I'd like to tell you is thank you, for subs and comments alike. And the second thing is that I hope that this video has hit its mark, depending on what you take this mark to be. So if you found the video fun, stay tuned for more, because I assure you, there is more to come. I know I've left a huge gap between uploads again, and while different things have come up, I don't think they've been the kinds of things that should have resulted in me neglecting my channel. So instead of an excuse and a promise for a better schedule for the fourth time in a row, I'd rather just upload and you'll see for yourselves, hopefully within the month. In the meantime, be good, thank you for watching, and have a great rest of your day. Peace out.